And does everyone you... have a handout? Everyone's got a handout, so Holden needs one. Here we go. Can we? Oh, oh no, sorry. Yes, you've got one of those. That's what I meant. Uh, by oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> If you could hold your questions till the end, we'll, we'll, we'll have a time for Q&A at the end as well. Yeah. Um, so I want to begin with our topic of salvation in Islam by just talking about how your message is really important. Your message is really important. And so we know that for, for Christianity, the message that Jesus commissioned us with, we see at the end of the Gospels, don't we? where Jesus says, say, at the end of Matthew's Gospel or at the end of Luke's Gospel, where he says... Sorry, that's just me. Where Jesus says that he's sending his disciples into the, into the world, to, to the nations around the world, with a message of salvation. And so Christianity is really a, a message of salvation. It's about what God has done to save us to bring about his kingdom, to, to bring glory to himself. But it, it, it's a message of what God has done. And Jesus sent out missionaries to preach this message. And, and so the, the message led to, to missionaries, right? So it's a very simple step, but I, I want you, you'll see why I'm saying this in a moment. Now, what is the message of Islam? What's the message of Islam? Well, it's not... A message of salvation. We can often think, oh yeah, all, all religions are the same. They've all got a, a message of salvation. They actually don't. Right? The message of Islam is, as you can see in your notes, there is one God, Muhammad is his messenger, and you have three choices. Okay, so when Muhammad sent out his followers, he didn't send them out with a message of salvation. It was a message of there's one God, Muhammad's his messenger, and you've got three choices. And so we're going to look at what these three choices are. And so this is from one of the most holy books in Islam that I'm reading from here. It's called Sahith Muslim. I won't go into the details of that now. But it says, Muhammad would say, fight in the name of Allah and in the way of Allah. Allah is the name of God in Islam. Fight against those who disbelieve in Allah. Make a holy war. When you meet your enemies who are polytheists, invite them to three courses of action. One, invite them to accept Islam. If they respond to you, accept it from them and desist from fighting against them. If they refuse to accept Islam, demand from them the jizya. Now, the jizya is the terms of surrender. If they agree to pay accept it from them and hold off your hands if they refuse to pay the jizya the tax seek Allah's help and fight them so you can see this was what Muhammad did Muhammad didn't send out missionaries he sent out jihadists and they went out with this message there's one God Muhammad's his prophet and you can see there there are the three choices and if you look at the map there you'll see where the jihadists conquered. They actually conquered very rapidly uh, a, a large area. So all the Eastern Roman Empire and a, a section of the West fell to their armies quite quickly. The Persian Empire off to the East fell to them. And that's how Islam spread. And that's its message. So in Christianity, the message of the gospel leads to missionaries and preaching, whereas in Islam, the message of Islam leads to jihadists. And that's just historically what happened there. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that salvation is not the main message of Islam. Right? So when, they were, when the jihadists are going around, they're not saying God has done something to save you. That's not what they're saying. And so we mustn't read our own experience as Christians into what we assume Muslims would do. You know, oh, they must be talking about how to be saved. No, 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 they, they, they weren't doing that. They weren't doing that. And in fact, to become a Muslim, you don't even have to know how to be saved. See, when I became a Christian, uh, when I was 19 years old, 
How did I become a Christian? Well, a man walked into the service station where I was working and he asked me if I was a Christian and I'd been thinking about the things of God and then he explained what God had done for me in Jesus and then he invited me to, invited me to pray the sinner's prayer and that was to confess that God was my creator, that I'd sinned against God and that Jesus had died for my sins and raised, been raised to bring new life. And so I had to pray in many ways and confess what salvation looks like right because it, that, that's the heart of being coming a christian isn't it yeah. you can't say i've become a christian but i don't know how to be saved yet right yeah. to become a christian you've got to pray about salvation right. now when it comes to islam you don't have to say anything like that to become a muslim you just need to say what i said before there is one god allah muhammad's his prophet that's all you've got to say. So you, I hope you can just see how salvation occupies a different place within Christianity and Islam. This is the first point I want us to get. They occupy very different places and then this has a, a consequence. One of the main consequences you'll find is that Muslims may not even be sure how they're going to be saved. They'll be hoping in a general sense that Allah will have mercy on them, but there is no act of God to bring about salvation and so if, if you've got a Muslim friend they may not even know they'll go oh I, I, I hope I will be I hope I will be and that's you know this comes back to the very beginning of, of their faith in that it's it's not really a faith about salvation now what I'm going to do though is I'm going to take you through what the Quran does say about salvation it's not that it doesn't say anything on this subject it certainly does it's just that it's not the main message. And so um, it's just not the main message. That's what I want to get clear there. So what I'll do now is I'm going to, uh, to take you through an overview and we'll work our way through and, um, and then we'll, you know, save up your questions and um, we'll go from there. So first of all, salvation in Islam is something that Allah promises to those who have correct belief and do righteous deeds. So if you look at that first quote, God has promised those who believe and do righteous deeds, they will have forgiveness and a great reward. So notice how forgiveness is spoken about here. It's in, it's in the future. Nothing's been done by Allah to give you forgiveness here and now right there are individual things you might do which might earn it for you now and we'll look at those in a short time but for for a Muslim it's I've got to believe the right thing I've got to do what's right I've got to do the righteous deeds and forgiveness is like a reward in heaven in the new creation it's not something so much they receive now Let's look at the next reference. This talks about how Muslims will be judged. Then those whose scales are heavy with good deeds, they are the successful. And those whose scales are light are those who lose their souls in hell abiding. So it's a really basic system of a scale. We often talk about the scale, don't we? About have you done enough good deeds? You know, so for Muhammad, that's, that's what he puts before his followers. You, you've got a scale here and uh, you've got to have enough good deeds. If you've got enough good deeds, it's going to go well with you. If you don't have enough good deeds, it's not going to go well with you. So in one sense, it's a pretty simple system that's put forward there. The problem is, of course, you know, how am I going to earn enough good deeds? Now, as it turns out, there ends up being basically three different paths that a Muslim can take. Now, again, we mustn't assume as Christians our understanding of salvation for a Muslim. So for us as Christians, you know, we read the book of Galatians, for instance, and we read there that if you, if you can keep the law, then, then you'd be right before God. If you can keep the law of God, then you'd be acceptable to God. Right? But we fail and so, you know, we need God to do something for us. And so we can come away from reading the book of Galatians and think, 
that you know it's all about keeping the law as one way of salvation but of course we can't do that so we go another way but in religions where you don't have God actually doing something to save you what ends up happening is that there become different paths with different things you can do to earn salvation and we're going to see these different paths within Islam Hinduism is actually the same as well there are three paths you can take in Hinduism. So it's sort of different for, to us as Christians. We think, keep the law. If you can't do that, you need to be saved. But in these other religions, there are multiple ways you can earn good deeds. So it's, a, it's a different system. Now, who are, uh, what is this first path? Well, as you can see in the notes, path one is for the best Muslim. These are for the best Muslims. They go straight to paradise. Their soul, straight to paradise. These are the jihadist martyrs who, who go straight to paradise. So let me read you a few verses from the Quran and uh, the Hadith. If you are killed or die in God's way. Now God's way in the Quran is talking about going on jihad. I'm not going to show you all that now, but th that's what it means. And you'll see it from the context here. If you are killed or die in God's way... Pardon and mercy from God are better than what they collect. Now, what they collect are those who don't die on jihad. So if you die on jihad, you get what's better than those who don't. If you die or are killed, you'll be gathered up to God. Okay, so you see what happens to the jihadist? Gathered straight up to God. Then this is an example from Muhammad's life of this teaching. Narrated Jabir bin Abdullah. On the day of the battle of Ahud, a man came to the prophet and said, Can you tell me where I will be if I should get martyred? The prophet replied, In paradise. The man threw away some dates he was carrying in his hands and fought till he was martyred. So very clear there that the, the people who die on jihad, straight to paradise. And you've probably heard that probably heard it just here or there in the media that this is what they believe well that is actually what Islam teaches so I want to say here that in Islam you can have assurance of salvation there is assurance of salvation for one group of Muslims those who die on jihad they have assurance of salvation and very often I hear Christian leaders say oh Muslims they don't have assurance they don't know what's going to happen to them when they die. That is true for most Muslims, but that doesn't mean that the religion doesn't offer assurance. It does offer it to a certain group. Okay? Uh, that is, in Islam, you can do enough good deeds to be saved. If you give your life in service to Allah, that, that is accepted as having done enough and it will wash away all your sins and, and everything else. Now, of course, you can imagine this teaching inspires radical behaviour. Um, you imagine if you're a parent and you're trying to just live a nice, quiet Muslim life and your child starts getting zealous for the faith. Um, you're going to try to tone them down, aren't you? You know, Because you don't want them doing this. But of course, that's, that's what the faith teaches. You know, To be an on-fire Muslim means to be taking these things very seriously. And uh, it, it has quite a different application um, to the, the, the Muslim life. And of course, it has led to a lot of suffering for Christians from this type of teaching as well. Anyway, that's the, the first path. That's the first path. The second path is for the good Muslim. The second path is for the good Muslim. Now, the good Muslim goes to the grave first. They go to the grave first. Uh, which is sort of like a purgatory in our sort of language, and then to paradise hopefully later. So what have I got here? Most Muslims are not martyrs, and so they take a different path. They earn Allah's mercy through the religious rituals of Islam, what are called the five pillars. These are the confession of faith, the feasting and fasting during Ramadan, the pilgrimage to Mecca, the five daily prayers, and the giving of money to Islamic causes. 
Uh, Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, is particularly the season for Muslims for doing good works. They're told that if they do, you know, if they pray in Ramadan, it's worth more than at other times of year. And so you'll see that Muslims will get particularly, you know, devout during Ramadan because they can earn more points at this time of year towards their salvation. Now, when, when your good Muslim dies, they go to the grave first and then hopefully to paradise later. So just a couple of descriptions of the grave here. Um, this is only a partial quote, so it's a little hard to know, but this is how it is. It says, behind them, that is those who have died, is a barrier until the day they are resurrected. And so the idea there is that these Muslims die and there's a barrier. They don't go straight to Allah first that there's this barrier there and so the messenger of Allah said indeed the grave is the first stage among the stages of the hereafter so if one is saved from it that is if you're saved from the grave that's what the martyr does they're saved from the grave then what comes after it is easier than it and if one is not saved from it then what comes after it is worse than it so you can see everyone's going to the grave. Some will get out. That's the martyrs. Now, what's interesting is that a Muslim can do good deeds which will be credited to another Muslim who is in the grave. Now, I bring this up because often like, I publicly debate Muslims. I've had many debates now. I'm having another one in Indiana next week. And when Islamic leaders speak to you, they'll say, how can Jesus die for the sins of another? How can one person pay for the sins of another? And we've got our answers to those uh, questions. But the point is, Islam actually has its own substitution theory, has its own doctrine of substitution. So have a look at this next quote here. Narrated Ibn Abbas, a woman from the tribe of Juhayna came to the Prophet and said, My mother had vowed to perform Hajj. Now, Hajj is the pilgrimage to Mecca. So, my mother was going to go and do Hajj in, to Mecca, but she died before performing it. May I perform Hajj on my mother's behalf? The Prophet replied, Perform Hajj on her behalf. Had there been a debt on your mother, would you have paid it or not? So pay Allah's debt, as he has more right to be paid. So I hope you can see there that this mother, sorry, this woman has come to Muhammad and said, my mother was going to go on pilgrimage to Mecca. She didn't do it. That's one of the pillars of Islam, one of the requirements. And Muhammad said, it's okay for you to do it on her behalf. So I just bring that up, that Muslims will say things like the cross doesn't make sense, one person representing another doesn't make sense. They've actually got it in their own teachings. But because salvation is not the main teaching of Islam, as I pointed out at the beginning, many Muslims may not be aware of this because it's, salvation is not the main message of Islam. But when you actually go and read their books, this is what they say. Mind you, I've, I have a Muslim friend in, in Australia and he, uh, he did this for his mother. So they obviously do know about it. He's been on pilgrimage twice, once for himself. So he's paid his debt to Allah and then he's gone for his mum, paid her debt. She's dead in the grave. Um, you also get these verses in the Quran where it says, uh, they will bear their own burdens in full on the day of resurrection and also the burdens of those whom they misled without knowledge evil indeed is that which they bear and so within the Quran there's this bearing of somebody else's love, love sins under certain circumstances now this actually creates a bit of a problem for Muslims this idea of going into the grave and only the martyr being spared and that's because Muhammad did not die as a martyr 
So what happens to him? What happens to the chief men within our religion, as they would ask and say? Well, look at the next verse here. So this is from the, uh, from the Quran. And Muhammad is instructed to say this. So it says, say, I am not something new among the messengers. And I do not know what will be done with me or with you. I only follow what is revealed to me. I am only a warner. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Here is Muhammad saying, I don't know what's going to happen to me. Have a look at the next reference where we get this put into practice. Allah's apostle said at a funeral, as for him, by Allah, death has come to him. So Muhammad is praying at a funeral. This is the context. He's praying at a funeral and there's a man, you know, they're burying him in the ground. He says, by Allah, uh, death has come to him. By Allah, I wish him all good. By Allah, in spite of the fact that I am Allah's apostle, I do not know what Allah will do to me. I want to say to you here and now, Islam doesn't offer you salvation. It's not offering anything. Sure. Yeah. Okay? If Muhammad does not know what will happen to him, what are they offering? Right? So you just got to be clear on this because the way it's presented is, you know, it's an alternative path to God. It's not even offering a path to God outside of the jihadist. Right? Unless you're prepared to go and fight for Islam and die in that way, then yes. But if you're not in that category, and thankfully most Muslims are not in that category, then what have you got? Like these are the, This is the Quran and Hadith. It's not offering anything. It's not even a fair comparison to compare it to Christianity because it, it, it's not even offering the same type of thing. They're just completely different religions and so this is where there is no assurance at all for Muslims but you've got to understand the different categories don't you that there are these different paths that Muslims can take okay so for most Muslims what Christians say is true and that is there is no assurance of salvation uh, they don't know what will happen in the grave um, they can do, you know, because there are many people who do the five pillars of Islam, but they're, they're clearly hypocrites. <coughs> you know, they've got hypocrites just as we do. And you can perform all the five pillars and still be a hypocrite. So I've done the five pillars, but I might be a hypocrite. I mean, look at my thoughts, look at my actions, you know. I'm not pure, so maybe, you know, even having done the five pillars, what's that going to mean for me? Now, let's continue. Every Muslim outside of the martyr on judgment day is taken to the mouth of hell. So again, you can see there's no, it's not a nice future for even a, a, a devout Muslim. So there is none of you who will not go down to it. That is the mouth of hell. That is a fixed decree for, uh, for, I think that should be from your Lord. Then we shall rescue those who are God-fearing and we shall leave the wrongdoers crouching there. So you can see that this going to hell, it, it, it explicitly says it's for the God-fearing as well. So the, there's not much of a promise here is there in terms of salvation that it's actually offering and we mustn't let Muslims you know create this impression that there are these different you know Christianity and Islam are sort of similar religions offering the same type of thing Islam is simply not offering you salvation um, there is uh, I won't worry about that now the final path is the third path 
final path is the third path. And this is for the bad Muslim. The bad Muslim. So the bad Muslim is the Muslim who never practiced the five pillars. They didn't go on pilgrimage. They didn't, you know, they might have drunk alcohol and just not lived as a Muslim. Um, but they still believe there was one God, right? So they still went, yeah, yeah, the, the, there's one God. So, um, so they, they've, they've said the Shahada, you know, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. And, and for them, they go to hell first. And then after hell, in the end, they can go to paradise. So I believe that Saddam Hussein, just before the Iraqis hung him, said, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. And that was his way of getting at the people who were hanging him because he was saying, I'll get there in the end. Doesn't matter what I've done because I'll, I'll, I'll do this. And so you can see here, whoever said none has the right to be worshipped but Allah and has in his heart good faith equal to the weight of a barley grain will be taken out of hell. And so that's, that's the third way. I was doing some evangelism on a university campus in Sydney and we were talking to a, a Muslim there and we were explaining about what God had done for them in Jesus and uh, they said, I'll just go to hell for a while and in the end I'll, I'll get out. Well, I don't need any salvation. Now, I said to them, you, you're playing light with the judgment of God. You're treating the judgment of God as a trivial thing. You're not even taking, you don't, you don't fear God to make that type of statement. Uh, if you really knew what the judgment of God is, you would not say that type of thing. But, but this, the point is in Islam, she, she was being consistent to what Islam teaches that, you know, if she just believes that there's one God, you know, in the end she'll get out. So, if you go back, I think, to the previous page, I've got a little diagram. Uh, my diagram sort of shifted around when I was reformatting this, but it's, it's all there, it's just shifted around a little bit. Uh, that diagram is how salvation works in Islam. There are these three paths that a Muslim can take. There's the martyrs who go straight to paradise. There's your good Muslim who goes to the grave and then other people might do good things for them. Hopefully Muhammad will intercede for them. Uh, there are other things that can happen that I'm not going to go into now. And then in the end, they'll go to paradise. And then, of course, there's the last group who they're going to go to hell. And then after a, a period in hell, they will, will go into paradise. So... That's what your Muslim is thinking. They're not going to say that publicly to you because they probably don't even think of saying it publicly to you. But they all know that the martyrs go straight to paradise. And so this is why you'll see whenever a Muslim dies, they'll be very quick to find some way of, of uh, calling them a martyr. And so, you know, we'd see this in, in, um, in Gaza at the moment where they'd say that these are martyrs, these are martyrs. And now, the reason they're saying that is that they want to assure, you know, they want to assure everyone that they've gone straight to paradise. So it's very important to be able to label someone as a martyr. And so they, you'll see them use this, this language. That's why they're using it. Because you might say, why, why bother calling them a martyr? Just say, you know, these people got killed and we're angry, but they don't want to do that. They want to say, no, they're martyrs. And they're saying it because of this reason. Hopefully you'll understand why, they're, why they use this word. Um, uh, so so th this is how they think. So if you, if you meet a Muslim and you want to talk about salvation with them, don't just think in Christian terms of, have you done enough good deeds? Because it's a little bit different for them. There's a little bit more to it. And so it's important to understand actually what it is they believe. And so if you're talking to a Muslim, you certainly can say to them, you know, have you done enough good deeds to go to paradise? And But they will most likely say, no, I don't think I have. And so that will work, right? That will work. 
But you can also say to them, which path are you on? Which path are you on? And when you ask which path are you on, then you're helping to make it clear to you that, that you understand that there are these different paths. So they're not going to be able to pull the wool over your eyes by just sort of saying, oh, you know, I'll get there in the end or, or something like that. Um, you know, you, you'll, you'll have a level playing field now. Um, and, and, and also when you ask them what path they're on, it helps to clarify it for them. So that you're now having a, a, a conversation where you both understand each other. And so th that's a, a way forward. So I've got that in my application here. Um, I, I, I just think it's really important for Christians to understand these three paths. Because otherwise we just take our own assumptions, which we sort of get from Galatians and everything else from the Apostle Paul, and go, yeah, it's either you know, your good deeds or it's this, you know, good deeds or grace, where it's, for them it's, it's different. So we need to think about the right questions to ask them. And so I actually, in my phone, I have that diagram of the three paths. And on a few occasions, I've just shown that to a Muslim and said, you know, which path are you on? And they go, oh, you know, I'm not really sure. And, but the, the diagram makes sense to them because that, that's how they think. That's how they think. So I would talk to them about their deeds, which path they're on, and the, the common answer I get is they say, oh, I don't know. I don't know which path I'm on. I, I might be, uh, you know, I'm not intending to be a jihadist martyr, so I'm not on path one. Am I on path two? Am I on path three? I don't really know. Because for them, that's their a lack of assurance. You know, am I on path two or three? So, you know, for us, like our lack of assurance is um, you know, because we know we haven't done enough good deeds, but for them it, it's also which path am I on? So it's just a different way of understanding assurance and lack of it. And we don't want to impose our idea of lack of assurance on them because they've, they've got their own different ways of thinking about it. Uh, so what I would say is, uh, yes, uh, you know, if they said to me, yeah, look, I don't know if I've, if, which path I'm on, I'd say, yes, people do try to make many paths to God. But when God comes to save us, there is only one path, and that is Jesus dying for our sins. This is the path I'm on, and you can be on this path too. You can have assurance that, that you'll go and be with God, that you'll be saved. And so that's how you could you know, take it from there. Um, now, if they wanted to push back a bit and say, oh, no, no, it, I don't need Jesus, you know, it, in the end, you know, I know I'll make it there then you use those references that I gave you, and I'm, I'm in the process of making a, a leaflet on this subject, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But you can just show them the references where Muhammad says, I don't know what's going to happen to me. And they're powerful references, you know, because if a Muslim saying to you, I'll be okay, I think I'll be okay, you just say, if Muhammad did not know what would happen to him, then are you better than Muhammad? And none of them are going to ever say that, right? You know, do you know more than him? He didn't know. You have no chance of knowing. You have no chance. And then just say straight to them, Islam gives you nothing. Because I want to say, if Islam does not give you salvation, then any other benefit that it may give, and you know, there are benefits to not drinking alcohol, and you know, there are some benefits then any other benefit, though, is meaningless if it doesn't give you this one, sure. right? Sure, right? That's it. And so you just got to say that to them and say, you know, yeah, Islam might have some benefits here and there and you know, whatever, but if you don't answer this question, you have nothing to offer me. Islam has nothing to offer you if you're a Christian. And uh, that's just, you know, we're just taking it on its own terms, but it does not... If it does not answer the question of how I can be right with God and how I know I can be saved, if it doesn't answer that, it gives us ultimately nothing. I've had some Muslims say to me, oh, I disagree with that diagram that you've drawn. Right? That diagram's not right. And, uh, and so 
if, if they ever did that to you, um, don't give up on the diagram. Right? Uh, what you need to say is, can you draw me a better one? Yeah, sure, sure. yeah you draw me a better one. And when they draw it for you, I've actually saved some of the ones that they've sent me. They are convoluted because there's all these different, you know, I've broken it down into two nice, neat groups, but there's all these other groups and there's arrows going all over the place and there's this big convoluted diagram of who gets saved and who goes to which part of the grave first. And, and yeah, it's this big, big mess of what happens. And it actually just proves my point more when they make their diagrams. So don't give up on the diagram. Uh, if, they, if they don't like it, say, can you draw me what you think it should be? And you'll see that, um, that, that you, you'll, it'll just prove the point better. Um, I want to give an application here. I assume this is probably not the case for you. Um, uh, in, uh, from what I've experienced of my American brothers and sisters in the churches here. But there are some Christians who will say, during Ramadan, I fast with my Muslim friend. So my Muslim friend fasts during the day. And, and so I fast to show solidarity with them. Um, what should we think about that? I'm suggesting that you don't do that. Of course. Yeah. 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 But let me tell you, there are Christians who say you should. You know, this is how we show solidarity. Now, the reason why you shouldn't is that they are trying to earn salvation when they're doing that. And so if you say, oh, I'm going to fast with you, the message you're giving them is, you know, you're trying to earn <laughs> salvation too. Like, it's, it's actually a really bad thing to do. I know there are significant people in missions who say do this, but I'm saying don't. And in fact, if you look at Mark's gospel, you know, the Pharisees and, and the followers of John the Baptist were all fasting, trying to get ready for the coming of God's kingdom. And Jesus said, I'm here. Feast. Have a feast. Right? Um, I'm, I'm bringing salvation. It's like fasting to try to prepare yourself and all that. You don't need that now. I'm here. Yeah. Right? So rather than fasting during Ramadan, I, I say feast and, and I say <laughs> salvation has come. But, but it's still good to understand, you know, when they're fasting, they're trying to earn it. And you could say, you don't need to earn it. It's time to feast. It's time to celebrate. You know, time for fasting's over. I'm not saying there may not be other times in your life where you may not fast at it, you know, to seek God on something else. But I'm just saying, we never fast to try to earn our salvation. Never. Right. Uh, and so just some, some thoughts there. Um, look, I'll have a, a bit of a break there. And then we'll have some questions. And then I might just look at how Muslims might push back with some, some questions. So any questions or comments? I'll grab a quick drink. Okay. Now, yes. Do they, uh, do they have any metric for what they consider good deeds? I mean... Or is that kind of ambiguous? No, the, they certainly there certainly are metrics throughout the Quran and the Hadith, and it, they will just be spelt out. You know, so it'll say, you know, if you pray during Ramadan, it's worth twice as when you pray when it's not Ramadan. And so, you know, that they have all these metrics. There are books you can get. I've, I've got one at home. It's called Easy Good Deeds which to us sounds crazy. But to them, it's quite serious. It's, it's a book called Easy Good Deeds, and it's just about these are the easy ones you can do to earn points. I to us, it, that sounds so crazy to the Christian mindset, but that's what they do. So, um, you know, if you have a dog, uh, then you lose one point of, uh, you know, unless it's for farming or something, but having a dog is a, a, a negative thing. Right? It should be a cat. Well, 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 yes. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, so, in it's not that I'm trying to sell my book, but I, I've I wrote a book, and I I've got a, a big chapter on salvation. And I give you a big list of all those types of things. This is like a summary of that. There, I think uh, wow. Olin might have. Um, he might go and grab some, but he, it's in the U.S. It's you know, on Amazon and everything. And so, I list out a whole lot of them that they. 
But to be honest, you know, the Quran, I mean, the Quran is what Muhammad said really to justify his own behaviour. You would not believe some of the stuff that's in the Quran. Yeah. Right? So in Surah 33, it, towards the beginning it says, all adoptions have been cancelled. You go, that's odd. Why would you want to cancel adoptions? Right? You keep reading down a bit further and then you find out that Muhammad's adopted son had a beautiful wife that Muhammad wanted. It's just straight up and down, he covets sure. his adopted son's wife. Yeah. But of course, people are saying, well, she's your daughter-in-law, you can't take your daughter-in-law. <laughs> right? It's just a bit off. So, so Allah, you know, cancels all adoptions and then, you know, Muhammad ends up taking this woman. But, you know, the man covets another man's wife and then Allah changes the law so that Muhammad can take her. So it's like the story of David and Bathsheba, but in reverse. Imagine if when David coveted Bathsheba, God changed everything so David could have Bathsheba. But that's what you get in the Quran. Like you, couldn't even, you wouldn't think of making this stuff up, right? But it's there. Anyway, so, so what you find is that if it's a good deed that's going to be helpful to Muhammad, then that's going to get you into paradise. Right? If it's a deed that is not going to be helpful to Muhammad, then that's going to send you to hell. Right? So everything's really extreme in there, and it's all to do with um, how it works itself out with Muhammad. And so, yeah, it, it's just on the extremes. You know, if you do this, bam, so, yeah. yeah. Well, even in jihad, it seems like they've got a real quandary here because it it says invite them to accept Islam. They're not supposed to go to war with somebody until they invite them to do that. And yeah. Did they run into Israel where the rockets were aimed and invite them before yeah. they? No. Well, th th that's going to be under a different set of rules. Yeah. You're going to have a different oh, set okay. there. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's going to be where the, the the Jews have had a chance and that chance is over. And so. Ah. So and, and, that, you know, and, um, and also that Israel used to be Islamic territory. So, uh, so the, the way it works is when the Muslims came out of the Arabian Peninsula, wherever they've conquered, that is meant to be forever Islamic territory. And so part of the offence of the nation of Israel is that it's not run by an Islamic government. That That's... That, that's the reverse of what's meant to happen. Now, this is also the case for Spain. So the jihadists still lay claim to Spain and they still lay claim to India um, just as much as they lay claim to Israel. It's just they don't talk about those others because you know, there's no advantage for them saying it at the moment. But they still want to get Israel back. So just recently they got a big chunk of um, Armenia back. Uh, with the Armenia Azerbaijan border, and it's the type of thing we wouldn't even hear about it, but they were really celebrating that um, because that was territory that Christians, you know, because the Armenians were Christians and they were conquered by the Muslims, and so the Armenians pushed them out to some degree, but then they were able to push it back, and so that was, you know, getting back what's ours. Any other questions or comments before I head on? As far as what you were talking about, as far as substitution theory, they also have, there's also a hadith that talks about the, the Jews and the Christians yeah. bearing the sins of the Muslims. Um, that's the first thing that came to my mind when you started talking about that. And uh, just, uh, just another example of what you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah, so they have this idea that. Christians and Jews will bear the sins of Muslims. And so, again, this is all in my book. I give you these references. But it, what ends up happening is because Allah hasn't done anything for you, there's just all these different paths. So there's this hadith where it says 70,000 Muslims will enter paradise without having to stand judgment. Okay? 
70,000. But it doesn't really tell you who they are <laughs> or how you can be one. It says something about, you know, they, they didn't look with the evil eye or something, but it's a, a sort of a vague description. And so, you know, how do you know if you're one of them? Like, you know, and so the, the, all I'm saying is that of these different paths, I've showed you the, the general ones, and they use this. I was in an Islamic area of Sydney, and in you know, and I walk around these areas, and we do a bit of walk up evangelism sometimes, and they'll have the posters, and it will say, "Come and see this shake," and you might be one of the seventy thousand who won't have to stand judging. Maybe like, if I go and listen to this speaker, I might be one of the seventy thousand. Like, I don't know. How do you? It, it, you know, it, it's just anything and everything can save you and every, anything and everything can damn you and you know, this is what happens when God's done nothing for you. Yeah. Um, Alright, well look, I'm going to look at a couple of ways that Muslims might push back. Yeah. And how are we going for time? I'll try to finish up in a sort of about 10 or 15 minutes. So they may quote to you from Ezekiel 18, <coughs> where it says, uh, no person can bear the sin of another. So in Ezekiel 18, there's a, a famous chapter about how each person is responsible for their own sins and they've, they've got to repent. And Muslims will often quote this to us and say, look, this is saying that one person, like it actually says explicitly, one person cannot bear the sin of another. I'll just, let me read it out. I didn't quote it there, but I'll read it out. Jeremiah, Ezekiel 18. I'll go to here if you want. Yeah, yes, please, if you could read it out for us. Ezekiel 18, 20. The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. But if the wicked man turns from all his sins, which he has committed, and observes all my statutes, and practices justice and righteousness, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Okay, thank you. So you see at the beginning of that reading that uh, you know, the, the, the father will not be killed for the son, the son for the father, and they'll, they'll give that to Christians, and that's one you've got to think about, isn't it? It's a pretty good verse there to be challenged with, uh, particularly as we're saying that Jesus is our substitute and does die in our place. Now, the first thing to note is with Ezekiel, that if you keep reading in the book of Ezekiel, in fact, just beforehand in chapter 16, and then afterwards, it talks about how God is going to provide a sacrifice of atonement. Yes. Yes. So, Whatever this verse means about one not being able to take the load of another, it's not saying that there's not an atonement for sin because it's just said that just a chapter beforehand. So it's absolutely got the idea of a sacrifice of atonement to take away sin. My second point would be that it's, uh, it's talking about fellow sinners. So the, the situation is where there's one sinner and another sinner and one sinner is repenting, and he can't bear the load of another sinner who doesn't repent. So it's quite a different situation. These, you know, it's not talking about Jesus who is sinless, and really in a different category to to the type of people who are being discussed here. Um, well, the context is very different in Ezekiel, and for the record, Jewish people will use the same verse. Mm say, how can Jesus bear your sin when it says this in yep. Ezekiel? And it's context, context, context. Yep. Yeah, and then, I mean, obviously with a, a Jewish person, we could look at Isaiah 53, where the innocent person can bear the sins of others, where it's explicit, but um, you know. They took that out of the reading, though. Sorry? They took that out of the yeah. reading. I bet 53, it's, they completely torn that page out. Mm. A, a, a Jew. Yeah, they don't. They won't quote that or talk to you about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so anyway, so if if you did talk to a Muslim, you'd you'd need to be ready on this verse, 
because this is one that they may bring back to you and so I don't want you to be surprised. Now, how can we explain the death of Jesus? Well, I think there are three ways that we can do it. The way that sin is often spoken about is as a debt in the Bible. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who sin against us. Uh, debt or a ransom. And in that case, if it's a fine, so if you, if you commit a crime I, and, a, uh, and, and a fine is involved, I can pay the fine on your behalf. So that is where one person can do something on someone else's behalf. That's a system that we've got which is acceptable within the government where for certain things a fine can be paid by somebody else. And of course when it comes to a ransom and Jesus speaks of himself in Matthew, uh, sorry, in Mark uh, 10.45 uh, that he's, he's giving his life as a ransom for many, that that idea of a ransom is where one is paid for another. And so there, that's the language that's given. And in that case, one person can do something for someone else. And so we've got the idea of a fine or a ransom in which a price is paid by one person on behalf of the other. Of course, the other way that the Bible explains it is with the Old Testament sacrificial system, which it does repeatedly. So we get the point. And that is that with the Old Testament sacrifices, you would lay your head on the animal's head and confess your sins. And so God is saying that this is what he accepts. Um, how it may work, in one sense, doesn't matter because God's saying this is the process that I have given you for approaching me. And so in the Old Testament sacrifices, we have a very clear illustration of how um, you know, a righteous animal can bear the sins of another and, and take those away. And so the Old Testament sacrifices are the model that's given to us. And you know, the book of Hebrews is the classic example in the New Testament of showing how that applies to Jesus and to us. Um, so in response to the Muslim, I talk about a fine and how a fine or a ransom can be paid by another, how it's, uh, it's demonstrated in the Old Testament sacrifices and that, and that this is what God accepts. And then finally, I would refer back to what I showed you before, where Islam has its own substitution theory, where somebody can do something for someone else. And say, so, you know, you've actually got a substitutionary idea, idea there anyway. So you're sort of undermining your own religion. They may bring up the next verse, which is, Every soul earns only to its own account. No soul laden bears the load of another. And so this is an influential verse. It appears four or five times in the Quran. And, uh, and so, that, you know, they would quote the first part of it. Each, uh, every soul earns only to its own account. And they say, you see, Jesus can't bear, bear my sin. But if you read the rest of it, notice what it says. No soul laden, that is, with its own load of sin, bears the load of another. And so this is what we actually believe as Christians. We don't believe that Jesus has sin and he then takes our sin. We've got here in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Uh, For our sake, God made him who had no sin to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so again, th this is the, the uniqueness of Jesus that allows him to be a sin bearer, that he doesn't have any sin. And that's just what makes him unique. Things are in a different category. You know, these other verses we've been looking at, when you get a sinless man, it, all the instructions about what sinful people can do are just a little bit different when you come to a sinless one. Now, this is what's different here. You see, if you say to a Muslim, Jesus is sinless, they will think all the prophets are sinless. So you see how you can take away from the cross? You can take away from the cross from a, from, in a few ways. You, you can take away from the cross by saying Jesus didn't die on the cross, and Islam does that. 
that certainly takes away from the cross. But another way that Islam takes away from the cross is not by pulling Jesus down, but by lifting everybody else up to the same level as him. And so they will say, Jesus is not unique. Yeah, sure, he's a sinless prophet, but all the prophets are sinless. And so this is not so much taught in the Quran, but it is certainly a very popular teaching that all the prophets are sinless. And this is why they're an example to us and why they could speak the word of God. And so, as I said, you know, the cross sort of pulls Jesus down. And that's one way of undermining the cross. But the other way of undermining the cross is to lift up all the prophets and make them equal to Jesus. And that takes away from Jesus as well, because there's no one like him. And so when I debate Muslims on salvation, I have to make it very clear that Muhammad is sinful. I've got to make that clear, because if I don't, then to the Muslim mind, they're going to say, well, Muhammad's sin sinless. You know, he, he didn't die for anybody, and he's sinless, so why is the death of Jesus unique? So you've got to make sure that you show them that no one's like Jesus. And it's pretty easy to do this. I've given you the Quran verse. So know, O Muhammad, there is no God except Allah, and ask forgiveness for your sin and for believing men and believing women. So very explicit that Muhammad had to ask for forgiveness of his sins. And so that's an important verse to know, uh, just to show, uh, you know, you can't lift Muhammad up to the same level as Jesus. He's just nothing like Jesus. No. Um, and again, I'm not misrepresenting Islam here. I'm just saying, you know, I'm just saying, let's be true to your own book, yeah. right? Muhammad is not equal to Jesus. That's, that's it. You know, um, you're not offering me a man who's sinless and can, can do something beyond what a normal man can do. You're just offering me a normal man who doesn't know what's going to happen to him, who needs his own sins forgiven. In fact, Muhammad needs Jesus. Muhammad needs the, the forgiveness of Jesus. So they, they consider Isaiah a prophet, right? And David a prophet. Do they consider David a prophet? Mm. They certainly consider David a prophet. Because both of them confess sins. In the yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, it's, it, this is the thing where because salvation is not the main message of Islam, that they haven't thought through this as much as Christians do. Because for Christians, you know, salvation is, is our bread and butter. And so we think about it a, a bit more carefully than they do. And so you know, that they will read, Muhammad, ask forgiveness for your sins. But, you know... This is not the main point of Islam, so no, he's sinless. Right? And, and, and that sort of works for them because it, it's not the main message. You know? And when it's not the main message, you have a bit of variation. But you know, they'd never vary on one God, Muhammad's his prophet. That's very clear on that, but you know, they hold different views here. So that's it for my presentation. Any other questions or comments? Did you ever speak to anyone and confronted with the fact that when he was dwelling in the cave and he getting all these visions, that he confessed his own his own words and in, in, written in antiquity, he was demon possessed. Is what he thought. Mm. Yeah. I mean, what, how did they reply to that? And he thought he was demon possessed, so his wife convinced him. Said, "No, no, you're really a prophet." And so then he assassinated all the people that was putting him down. Said, "No, you're not." So he secretly started warring against anybody that argued with him. Yeah. I mean, how do they defend that? The vast majority of them know nothing about it. Okay. So the... That was going to be my question. If you could talk about how they how they don't study the Quran and the Hadith and the yeah. biography of Muhammad versus how we do Bible studies. They're not like gathering together in a mosque doing Quran studies. Sure. They don't have small group Quran studies like we do. That they, some might have small group Quran studies, but that's only a fraction of Islam. Islam's based on all these other books as well. The, so, yes, because, I, I, 
Because he didn't really record and write any of this. This nice. is nice. second hand. This is second, third, and fourth hand. Yeah. People who heard him speak and say, oh, I listened to the master speak, and this is what he said to me. Yeah. Go to Burger King. <laughs> no, write that one down. That's special. Yeah. No, no. Well, I'll give you an example just on this. In the Quran, it says multiple times that Muhammad did no miracle. So yeah. people will come to him and say, uh, you know, wh wh why don't you do a miracle like Moses did? And he'll reply, I am just a warner. Right? So if I say to you, you know, if you said to me, why don't you do a miracle? And I say, I'm just a warner. I'm saying, I don't do a miracle because I, I just warn people. Right? right. That, that, that's, that's the only way you can interpret it. And it says this multiple times. So I've collected about 13 verses where it says that type of thing. When you go and read the Hadiths, which are about his life, which were written up about two to 300 years after, yeah. he's doing all these types of miracles, right? You know, he's splitting the moon in half, he's you know, making water pour out of his hands, like it's all this stuff and you go, wow, like this is so different to the Quran. Mm -hmm. And Muslims try to, there are some Muslims who just say, yeah, we don't accept any of those later stories. Uh, but then there are others who want to, you know, try to work their way around it and have, have arguments for it. But the, the Quran's really clear on it. Now, the, the way that they learn all these, you know, all these hadiths, and remember, you know, the hadiths, you know, it's like an old school encyclopedia set. Remember your old school, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica or whatever, you know, it's, it's an enormous thing. The, these hadiths are just enormous collections. And so you can never read them all. And so what you have is uh, the Imam will have learnt some of these and he'll teach the Muslim community what Muhammad was like. And so they very much become uh, dependent upon their teachers to tell them what Muhammad's like. And by and large, what the, what the leaders will say is, Muhammad's the best. You know, you want to talk about righteousness? He was righteous. You know, Will they bring up the idea of uh, Muhammad assassinating people, as yeah. you spoke about? There are multiple examples of him, even assassinating mothers, uh, yeah. breastfeeding children, right? Yes. Um, they're not going to bring that up because that's sort of, you know, that's a shameful thing. In, in, our, in this context, that's shameful. There might be other places where you want to bring that story up, but they, they won't bring it up. And so this is what happens. Muslims get a very sanitised view of Muhammad and, and and they just don't know what the original sources say right. and, and so for those who then go and actually read the earliest accounts of his life and find out what he was like they can sort of go two ways I guess some would just say wow I've just been lied to my whole life right. and they reconsider things so um, uh, oh sorry what's his name who's the young guy who died of Nabil Qureshi. Nabil Qureshi. Sorry, he's had a mind blank. So you may have heard of a young man called Nabil Qureshi. He, he was a Muslim like that. He'd been brought up to think Muhammad's the best. And then he was challenged by a Christian to go and read the, 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 the earliest accounts of Muhammad's life. And he went, wow, what have my leaders been saying to me? Okay. So he ended up becoming a Christian. Others might go the other way and say, yeah, that's how we need to treat the enemies of Islam. You know? Uh, we, we should do what Muhammad did. He had assassins. He was torturing people. He was, you know, this is what he was like. And, and so it can get scary. Or well, it becomes the Islamic State or the Taliban. That's, they're doing what Muhammad did. They're not an anomaly. They're authentic to, to the record of Muhammad's life. He's also a pedophile. He's a narcissist. He couldn't, he couldn't contain his own appetites. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it just blows my mind. Yeah. Just, of whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them, lest yeah. the glorious light of the gospel. I'll, I'll just give an example of um, polygamy. So, Muhammad practiced polygamy himself. He taught polygamy for his followers. Um, he promised polygamy in paradise. But, when someone came to him and wanted to marry his daughter... He said, no, because she would enter into a polygamous relationship. And he said, I, I don't want that for my daughter. And so it, 
You know, he just has these different standards. He says to Muslim men, you can have four wives and all your slave girls. But he, you know, so this is Surah 33, verse 50. He is given a special privilege to take any woman he wants. Yeah. Now, at that point, you've got to say, I mean, what type of religion is it where the person's getting special privileges to take any woman they want? That's what we call a cult, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know how else yeah. you call that. Then that can be and, and I don't even like I don't want to say that I have no desire to say that, but you know it, Surah thirty three is all about him taking his adopted son's wife and getting special permission about being able to take any woman, and then and then the idea with polygamy is that the woman at least gets equal time with the husband, so they might be on, you know, Monday nights here, you know, then. It, you, you, you rotate in equal time, so there's some justice among the wives. So, uh, Surah 33, verse 51, then says, he doesn't have to do that. He can get anyone he wants. Right? So he just gets all these exceptions to, to everyone else. And you've got to say, wow, like, let's at least be honest as to what's being said here. Yeah, yeah. anyway. I think there's, there's a hadith that says, you know, his, his young, youngest bride, Aisha, she said that it seems that Allah wishes to fulfill your every desire. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. sometimes it's just their own sources that hang them. Yeah, yes, yes. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and that's, that's in my book, but it's online and, and everything else as well, all those. Yeah, where his own wife goes, it appears that Allah uh, works to fulfill your desires. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> <How>? Yes! <laughs> How, how do Muslims uh, generally respond when you do point out these inconsistencies? Um, do they immediately get offended, or, or look, do they I, just really consider, like, hey? I'll be honest, I, um, a scary debate I had, although once it starts you get into it and you don't get scared, it was in Sydney, in Bankstown in Sydney, and this is an Islamic area of Sydney, and there were a thousand beards and burqas, and they invited me to come in to speak with this Indian guy they brought in. And I brought all this up. I brought all of it up, right? And they had to deal with it because I'm giving the references, and I'm saying, this is why I don't accept it. You know, this is it. If you, you know, if you, if you came to my house and you saw my wife undressed and then you said, Allah has told me that I can take her, I would say you're a false prophet. It that, that's it. Yeah. Like, unfortunately, there are men in the church who say, God's told me to take this other woman to leave my wife and go, you know, you yeah. hear that from time to time. God's told me and you're going, no, yeah. God did not tell you that. Yeah. But it's like when it comes to Muhammad, and this is what I, I'm saying increasingly to Muslims, they refuse to hold Muhammad accountable for his words. And one of the things in the Bible is, if someone speaks in the name of God, yeah. they have to be held accountable for those words. Yes. This is a basic principle. So that's in you know, Deuteronomy 17, oh, sorry, Deuteronomy 13, 18, and no doubt you know, other places. But a prophet needs to be held accountable for what they say. And if you're not prepared to hold Muhammad accountable for what he says, then you're in a cult, right? You just like you're in a cult. I don't know how else to say. It. Again, I don't want to say that. I don't want to say that. But what else are you supposed to say if this guy can say anything, do anything, and no one holds him to account? Anyway. Anyway, look, I might just finish up there because we've been going for uh, almost uh, enough time. So just remember with salvation, it's not their main message. Uh, and so how they think about it's very different to us. Even in terms of works, it's very different to us. They've got those three paths. And, uh, you know, and so there is assurance for some. Uh, for most, though, there's not. And, and so when you're talking to them, you might want to show them a diagram of those three paths. That can be a helpful way forward. Um, but just remember that Muhammad did not know that he would be, what would happen to him. And so this is where I want to finish in the end. 
Islam is offering you nothing. It, it actually offers you nothing. It's only the Lord Jesus Christ who gives what we need. And that's why he's the water of life. He's the bread of life. He's the light of the world. He, he is what we need and we can praise God for that. Amen. Give them the title of your book and your website again. Yes, yeah, so no, it, it's on, uh, on your notes. <laughs> it's on the notes at the yes. URL at the top. If you go there, I've got a whole online training course. What I just gave you here is one of the videos on that course. So if you go there, you'll see on the menu, online training. Just click on that and all my talks are free. Bam, they're all there. And, and then you can download all these notes. It's like a 20 page document that you can download uh, as a PDF and you can look at that there. And if you wanted to get my book, you'll see it on the website too. And there's evangelistic leaflets that you can download and, and all those types of stuff to uh, help you. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Holden, would you mind closing this out in prayer? Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy that you have toward us. That we have your word that we can rest upon, your truth. And you have revealed it to us by your Holy Spirit, how gracious you are that we can know this and experience it and have uh, confidence in our salvation in Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, uh, I, I pray for these men as they go about uh, sharing uh, the truth of Christ and refuting uh, uh, the ridiculousness of these, these, these false prophets. And I pray that you would strengthen their hearts and their spirit and their mind to be strong in this and, and uh, remember that uh, you said your word that uh, they hated you first when they hate us and they reject us. Thank you, Father. And may uh, what has been said uh, grow in our hearts and we'll be confident. Thank you in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. Amen.